sing to the Lord with thanksgiving. Make melody to our God with the instruments. God covers the heavens with clouds. There is rain for the earth. Makes grass grow on the hills. Announcements? The uh, announcements that I have are in the bulletin on the bulletin. Next set, the next first hour of breakfast will be October 7th. There should be a sign up sheet in the fellowship hall of what we need and what you can help with. So if everyone can check that out, that'd be great. That's the only announcement that I have. Thank you. Off to the peace of Christ. Peace be with us. The opening prayer hymn, 575. Come and find a quiet center. First one.
second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Now Nineveh was a very large city and it took three days to go through it. Jonah began by going a day's journey into the city, proclaiming, 40 days more, 40 more days, and Nineveh will be overthrown. The Ninevites believed God, and a fast was proclaimed, and all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. When Jonah's warning reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, took off his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat down in the ash, in the dust. This was a proclamation he issued in Nineveh. Do not let people or animals, herds or flocks, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink, but let people and animals be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows? God may yet relent with compassion and turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. But to Jonah this seemed very wrong. He was angry. He prayed to the Lord. Isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? That that is what I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarnish. I know that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Now, Lord, take away my life. For it is better for me to die than to live. But the Lord replied, Is it right for you to be angry? And I'm going to read the remaining at the end of the message. So, most of us probably know the story of Jonah. Jonah was a prophet, and he was supposed to go to Nineveh and uh, proclaim uh, that the end was near for them because of the wicked ways. But he didn't go. He went and he ran. And he ran to Tarnish and to Joppa and got on a, a commercial ship and sailed out across uh, the Mediterranean, is what it thought. But God sent out a terrible wind, the Lord did, and the ship was uh, uh, about to be broken up, and the sailors threw all the uh, cargo overboard, and they're trying to figure out why the Lord was so angry at the sailors. Jonah was in the underneath, in the underneath the deck, and he was fast asleep, and they got him up and said, you know, how can you sleep through this? And what have you done? And the sailors uh, cast a lot, and it fell upon Jonah, and he confessed that he was responsible for the trouble because he was fleeing from the presence of God. And after they, uh, uh, decided uh, to go, uh, Jonah decided to, uh, to give up his life, and they threw him into the sea, and we know the story, uh, mostly from childhood anyway, a great well picked him up, swallowed him, and he stayed in the belly of the fish for three days, or belly of the well, however you want to, what you want to use. And there he was for three days and three nights, and he turned, Jonah uh, repented also, uh, and there's a whole uh, nine, uh, several, about nine verses of what he said. And then he came up, and, and uh, the fish eventually vomited him up onto the dry land again, and uh, Jonah had a second chance, and that's where the reading started. So the question that I ask is again, can we say no to God's Spirit? Is the book of, of, of uh, Jonah an actual history of historic event? Well, probably not. But it was used as a, a, a parable. The writer is anonymous. No one really knows who wrote the book of Jonah, somewhere around 790 to 739 BC. Yes, there was a prophet Jonah. 
There was a city called Nineveh, now in Iraq. Well, and it was a, a, a real city, it was a great city, a, a larger population than 120,000, as it said. And yes, there was a seaport named Java and a town named Tarshish. There was a commercial shipping uh, route that went out to sea or out into the Mediterranean. But the story is built around these real things. It's a parable, so to speak, and it, is, it, is, uh, it should be understood as that rather than uh, a, a literal story. I mean, when we get caught up in an image today when I was in a child from my childhood, the, the real story, yes, somehow Jonah survived in the belly of the fish. That is still alive today. That I think it's an actual story. That literally happened. This, a story, a parable is a story that illustrates the point of what was happening at the time. And what was happening at the time uh, was that Israel, Judah, was, uh, the kingdom was divided, and that they were not doing exactly what they were supposed to do. This is a, this is a story or a parable that can also be applied in many different ways through time. There's many different ways that a, a parable and a story uh, can be understood. I used it in my, when I got ordained, I used part of it uh, in a different way that I'm using it today. Um, in other words, it can be applied in our time today. It has things to tell us along the way. What was the first thing that happened to Jonah? He heard a voice that told him to take an action. This voice was above his noise of his thoughts. And I know this idea is difficult for us moderns to understand. We um, are difficult, uh, the voice of God. There's many people along the way who have used that phrase, the voice of God, or God told me to do this, or God told me to do that. But in reality, it probably was their own selfish uh, uh, need or action that they wanted to do. It's difficult to discern the voice. So I'm beginning to think there are different power levels of the spirit. Because I don't think we really can get away from the presence of spirit. Because uh, we all are connected to it, and that's what generates our life. I mean, without the spirit and, and the power of that spirit, life, I think, would not exist. Because it doesn't exist without the power of the spirit energy. We can convert this power in various different ways, in various different levels, in various different forces. So we're not always peaked out and listening to God's voice all the time. There's sometimes in, in, in our life, most of us uh, can say that something stuck out in, her, in your life where God spoke to you, but it was loud and clear above all the chatter of the day. So, and I don't think, again, that we can live outside the Spirit of God. I just don't think that's possible. It's just different levels and in which we convert it to, and uh, uh, different wives, so to speak, to use electrical terms. Uh, but anyway, uh, Jonah ran from the voice. His, his level of uh, volume was uh, 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 very high, and he knew that what he was hearing. And being a, a prophet, he should have known better. Uh, that, that's the first thing that I, you know, you're a prophet. You, you know the voice of God, and you know the consequences of you not listening to the voice. He knew better. He wasn't an average person. He was someone who was always, was already, knew how God's spirit worked, worked or he should have. I think most of us uh, know or have experienced uh, doing something or an action that was wrong, but we did it anyway. I mean, I, I, if you look back in your life, I'm sure you can find one where you said, I wanted to do this out of my selfish desire, and you know, knowing that there was going to probably be negative consequences coming from it. His self-desire, in this sense, was that he had to look at two choices. He had two choices. He could go to Nineveh, or he could run. You know, I can understand why he didn't want to go. But he thought uh, the easiest choice was the better one. And that is not always the case, even in our lives. 
Sometimes we look at life and we say, well, this is easy for me now, but, you know, we'll go with it. Uh, we don't want to go too far down in the future. And we know it's not a good choice, but we do it anyway because we're short-sighted a lot of times. The easiest is not always the best choice in our lives. I, I, I mean, most of again, most of us know that. So sometimes we are short-sighted. I think we live in a world, a commercialized world. It's easy to finance something. You can go and, and, and uh, the commercials use that a desire of our selfishness to sell things. It only costs you so much a month to sign here. The people are in debt up of the, up over their head. Now I know that things cost a lot these days and the wages are down and there's a lot of uh, goes into all of that. Uh, I don't really want to get into that aspect of it today. Sometimes we need to do a, a, a number of other actions to get where we want to, to go. So we see our goal into the future, and we, but we have to do all these things before we get there, and we sometimes lack the patience. We want it now. Again, we live in a now society. We want everything now. Uh, uh, not uh, that's, a, that's a general term. That's not everyone. Sometimes there are no choices. I think people live in some situations where there is no choices. There's just that which lies in front of that person, and that's it. And sometimes uh, there is just one good choice. Was doing nothing an option in our lives? Is there times when we simply, by doing nothing? Is an option. Is doing nothing in life sometimes an option? Well, is not doing something, uh, not doing nothing, saying we're having patience to wait and see, or is it just because we just don't want to get actively involved in the situation? I think there's two different things there. Yes, there's times when we should have patience and we should uh, take time to pause. I'm a person who believes in being proactive in one's life. That it is always better to be uh, proactive and be aware of what's going on. Yes, there are times to wait and pause. I agree with that. And sometimes I get over uh, zealous and I want to solve everything right now. And I lack the patience that it takes to solve the problem. Patience. That's a virtue. That, that is to be informed as best as one can or take the time to be educated in any given situation I think is always better. Take the time and educate yourself. Pause and find yourself uh, uh, get a better view and understand where you're at. We live in an information age. We should use it. I don't think we use it enough. That there's tons and tons of information how the reams and reams of all kinds of stuff, but we simply close our doors. I wonder sometimes if, if we need to go back a thousand years, if they had at their disposal what we have now, where would the world be? I, I think we don't use the information or that we don't search it out. Even in your situation, uh, it, is, it is best that the one still to be informed or education or educated. It's always best, no matter what. Sometimes you, you don't have the time, you have to make a decision right away. And there I think you rely on your intuition or the spirit to move you and prompt you along the way. You have to step back and listen and allow the, the, the situation to kind of uh, unfold in front of you a little bit and allow and listen. And again, in, in Jonah's uh, situation as a prophet, he knew that. I, I, you know, if, if I'm going to go to the literal ideas, the prophet knew that. He, he did what, was thought, what, what he thought was in his self-interest. He did not want to be the bearer of bad news and tell the city to repent and change your ways or else. You know, all of us have seen this weird guy standing on the street corner or in a parking lot, and he shouts, the world is coming to an end, repent. I know most of us would probably say, I'm glad I'm not that person. I'm glad God didn't move me to stand there and do that. 
Well, so in some respect, I can understand why Jonah didn't want to do that. Because he's going to be that weird guy on the street corner proclaiming the world is coming to an end to Nineveh. Or you have, must repent. How do we react to this in our day? Well, I can tell by the looks that you know, we, we react in different ways. Sometimes we think the guy's crazy or some other word. But I try to think, well, I'm glad God didn't put me in that position. Uh, maybe we should have some sympathy or empathy uh, for that person as well as Jonah. Because I think everybody has a place to pay and play in our, in our world, in our reality today. But how do we balance the pleasures of life with the practical, practicalness of life? I think that's a, a really good question to ask in, in a time in which we live. We have so many products, so many things that are disposable, at our, at our, uh, at our looking up in the face. How do we balance that? We want, I, as a, it seems like some of the younger generation or even in the older generation, want both worlds. And sometimes we think the younger generation is lazy. I'm not sure. I think sometimes previous generation has spent too much time creating wealth for themselves and not enough of time enjoying life. So there is a balance, I think, for sure. But I want to, uh, you know, what that is, I think it, it depends on one's given situation. Youth sports and other activities are being brought into the spotlight these days. And we are super active with our kids. Parents and single, single parent families are stressed, uh, along with their finances of all kinds, are stressful. We want everything for our kids. But they might kids are all grown now, so I'm that older. But I see that in the younger generation, the younger people that I talk to. The, uh, I, I met uh, when I was up in Nova Scotia this week, at Dartmouth. I met with a person that I knew for some time when they lived in Newfoundland. They didn't have any children when they lived in Newfoundland. Life was simple and easy and fun. Now they have two kids. They are thinking of the swimming class and this and that. They are super, super busy. And I can see the expression on their faces that life was different. And they said they reflect on the times when they lived in Newfoundland and how easy and fun that was. Now life is bearing down on them. They have two kids and they have to look to the future. Making choices are not always easy today. It's still. Jonah thought he would try to hide under the radar of all that was happening around him. He didn't want to be aware of nothing as the boat was about to sink into the sea. I hear this phrase more times than not anymore a lot of times. It, uh, the phrase that this country is going to hell in a handbag. I hear that a lot anymore, more and more. The question I ask is what are these people who are thinking and saying this, what are they doing to lift the sinking boat for the master? Are they willing to change? Or are they basing their thinking on their uh, past uh, experience in life and don't want to change? And they don't want to look into the future with a changing optimism. I think that sometimes is why these people speak of this country is going to hell in a handbag. The verse and, and, and in, in the, uh, uh, that is in the scripture is that, uh, that God is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore has no bearing on humanity for not changing. God may be that way, but we are to be changing and growing. We should not let that verse reflect on us and say, well, I don't have to change because I am going to be the same today, yesterday, and I'm just going to be the same forever. Our bodies tell us otherwise. They change 
If you listen to our bodies, they are not the same as they were yesterday. And they're not going to be the same tomorrow. We are all important in this world and life that we are living. No one can hide under the table. I hear this sometimes lately. I turn the news off. I don't want to hear it. I don't want to converse with people. I don't want to talk to them about anything. I just want to live my life and that's it. Too many people are hiding under the table and not being engaged in some small way. You don't have to be standing out in the street corner with signs and protesting, but you have to be engaged in the world around you. I know there's a, 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 some people that I went to lunch with, Charlie, I went lunch with the other week, really haven't changed much in their theological perspective from the time that they were a child. I was I really kind of a, kind of taken back by that. But they still are using the same phraseology that they used many, many years ago. And, and really did not really do any research into the, uh, the phrase that they were using and saying the Bible says this, but in reality it doesn't say it. So again, one needs to do one's research and understand why one is, you are saying the phrase you're saying. And you must change your grow. What's interesting about the Jonah story is that the soldiers, uh, or the sailors, uh, I misspelled that word, or my spell checker must have put that word in, Wonderfully for me. But anyway, it's the sailors. Uh, uh, they did uh, get saved. They woke up and, and woke up Jonah, and, and they realized that Jonah's God could save them. And they believed in God, the God of Jonah. And, and the idea begins to uh, center around uh, in the story about forgiveness, grace, and mercy. Who God has mercy upon. I think this is really where the story hinges upon. The sailors, they were willing to pray to the Lord, or Yahweh, or, 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 or uh, Jonah's God, and to ask for forgiveness, grace, and mercy, and they even offered a sacrifice uh, on the ship, and they were willing to accept the reality of a bigger God. It's interesting in the text how it goes from Lord, capitalized, to God. But it's referring to a more universal understanding of the uh, understanding of God, it says it uses the word God. When it's talking about the individual God for Jonah, they use Lord, capitalized. Or that would be Yahweh, the God of Israel. Jonah was was now uh, he couldn't he couldn't see beyond the idea that his God to save people outside of his chosen Israelite uh, Judah people. He didn't understand that God, and, that's not, and this time is to use his God, can reach out and is a more universal God beyond the chosenness of Israel. This is one of the ideas that, were, uh, that I read about. And he was even willing to die for his belief rather than change. So he ended up getting thrown over, uh, over the ship as a sacrifice to save, and even then, God saved him. He didn't understand that God is bigger than just his God and his nation God. He didn't want difference in his world. Yes, in the belly of the well, he confessed his faith and was saved. Again, how have we changed these many years? Do we still think and believe and act in the same way that we did when we were at the age of 20? Most of us are well past that. We have changed uh, over the years. Has the world changed? Or is it simply repeating itself with a new generation of people? Does history repeat itself over and over again as we spiral down through time? Do we ever learn? Does humanity ever 
similar. Wars are because different cannot live together. Enmity lives between this and that, and different, as Genesis writes. Yet God went on to save both the sailors and the ship, and even Jonah. A larger God, a universal God, has the ability to save all of humanity. Yes, a big, a big fish swallowed up Jonah, and in this pri private space he repented, and he sang praises to his Lord, uh, his God Yahweh. And the whale, after three days, vomited him up on the shore of, of uh, Joppa, the Joppa port. And it took three days to, to travel to the plain, and it's that 40 days that the Lord will destroy the city. What is also interesting in the text is the use of numbers. Three, 40, 120. These all have meaning. I'm not gonna get into them. I, uh, it's more than I have time to get out, into. You can call that sacred geometry. You can call it numerology. You can call it astrology. You can call it prophetic numbers or divine numbers. It comes in many different names and understandings. But whatever you want to use or call them, numbers carry knowledge. Numbers are used to build, as well as letters and words. All of these, uh, all of these are used as symbols, spiritual meaning, non-literal uh, uh, ways of understanding, as well as literal ways. But the Bible, I think, is, is uses every literary tool to tell its story. It's incorporated into the story, into the use of the language. Next Sunday, I'm going to go a little more into that. Up to this, up to this point, Jonah would have been better off just doing what the Spirit of the Lord told him to do and go to Nineveh. Yeah, sometimes we don't always do the things we should. They repented. Here's another interesting statement. Everyone repented, every kind of animal, right down to every living thing. What was interesting in the text, even the animals had to put sackcloth on and repent. The animal life spirit is important. Now you would have thought Jonah would have been happy. That the Ninevites, the Ninevites repented, and he should have been praising God and happy. He wasn't. He went off in a corner and he pouted and he whimpered and he groaned in whatever word you want to say. And he was downright angry. Because God changed his mind and decided not to destroy him alone and all his people and animals. He thought the Lord cannot change his mind. How can he say the Ninevites? And Jonah and his chosen people, both. He didn't understand how God could reach out and save both. And it made him mad. You look around. You, you start talking about universal salvation. Ooh, people get angry. I've got people get downright mean. They don't like it. I'm saying you're not. If I'm doing things right and you're doing things different from me, you, how can you be saved? This is incorporated into the Jonah story. I was thinking as I was beginning to finish the message, Jonah had like three lives in his story. First, he was a prophet that ran from his responsibility. He died in the sea, but the well saved him. He was re reincarnated into his next life, and he went to Nineveh and did what he was supposed to do. But then he died again because he got angry. So in a res some respect, he lived kind of three types of life. He lived his days sour and bitter, 
and angry at God. Although in the story God and the Lord are used, Yahweh our God took care of Jonah even when he so said committed suicide and threw his body into the uh, sea to be a sacrifice. The well saved him. When he went and sat and pouted at the edge of the city, a plant grew up over top of him and gave him shade. He was still angry at that. He sat on the outer side of the city, bitter, sour, and waiting for the Lord to destroy the city. But God took care of him anyway. I've also read that the story of Jonah can be seen as a warning to Judah and Jerusalem for, they not, for not doing what the God's chosen people were supposed to do, that they were supposed to reach out to the greater world around them, the difference, and tell the world around them that there is a God that is slow to anger, abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. And this story illustrates the failure of what they do. Did, uh, failed to do. Jonah represents or is a type of Judah or the Jewish nation. Applying it to us today, we could be a type of Jonah as we live our lives. Which are we of Jonah? Which would we do? Would we run? Would we be obedient? Would we want to be that person standing on the street corner? Mm. Not every one of us cut, is cut out for that particular job. But we are cut out for something. We are willing to do certain things within our parameters, our ability. God or God's spirit is all around us, I believe. But sometimes we need to go into the belly of the whale to see it. Sometimes we just need to spend time alone with God and God's spirit. I think more times than not, there will be a better outcome in our journey if we take time to listen. I'm going to read the last part of, of, the, of the scripture reading. So I left you with, but the Lord replied, is it right for you to be angry? So God is asking Jonah, is it right for you to be angry? I took care of you. I did all these things, and you're still angry at me. Jonah had gone out and sat down at a place east of the city. There he made himself a shelter, sat in the shade and waited to see what would happen to the city. Then the Lord God provided a leafy plant and made it grow up over Jonah and gave him gave shade for his head to ease his discomfort. Jonah was very happy about the plant. But at dawn the next day, God provided a warm which chewed the plant so that it withered. Then the sun rose and God provided a torturing, torturing east wind and the sun blazed upon Jonah's head so that he grew faint. He wanted to die and said, it would be better for me to die than to live. Mm, yeah. But God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? Is it, he said, and it is, he said, and I am so angry, I wish I were dead. But the Lord said, you have been concerned, you, you have been concerned about this plant, though you did not tend it, nor make it grow. It sprang up overnight and died overnight. And should I not have concern for a great city of Nineveh, in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left, and also many animals? It ends with that question. Does God have concern, have the right to be concerned above our own personal needs? I think sometimes we need to take time to listen and to go into the belly of the well, uh, the belly of the whale, and take time to meditate and to listen. 
Listening, I think, is a very important part of our life. You and I will not say amen. The communion is in the back as well as the offering plate. And Josiah will play, turn around and see.
to bless the offering, even though it is at the back of the pews. We lift it up to you, O oh God, and you bless each one who gave, however they gave. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. The hymn of communion, 386. Become as guests invited. Concern would be that my 
sister-in-law has surgery Tuesday to fix a hernia. Um, her name is Debbie. Having surgery? Yeah. Yeah. That was a nice rainy day. People are going and traveling, enjoying the last of the season. It's autumn now. We're thankful for the season that they change. We are blessed in this church. Let's join our hearts and minds together in prayer. Autumn's prayer. God of all seasons, we thank you for autumn. We thank you for the touch of coolness in the air. That gives us a new burst of energy. For the coloring of trees that show the creativity of the divine artist. For the falling leaves that reveal the strength of the branches. For the youth of the fields that bring peace to our souls. For the smiles on the pumpkins that bring joy to the children. For the fall harvest which that brings us gratitude for the bounty of our land. For this change of seasons that reveals the circle of life. God of all seasons, as you transform the earth, transform us by your spirit. Amen. We thank you, Lord, for these words. We are truly blessed in this time in the midst of where we are. In this tumultuous world, but Lord, even in the midst of the sea and the, the tumultuous of life, you bring us peace, a centeredness in which we can go and listen to you in the depths of our soul and heart. I pray for this church, that this church out, that you may move the minds and hearts and the feet of individuals to join us, to share in us the joy of worshiping the God that lives forevermore and that speaks to each one of us in many different ways. I lift up our denomination
should all be blessed. Someone is in the sound of these words or hear them as, as, a, as a recording and need help, please reach out to somebody. There are many, many people who care. The hymn of invitation, 560, leaning on the everlasting arms. 560.